Welcome to Medical Society, my name is Vedan and today we're going to be uh, learning about fetal medicine. So the thing is, this type of speciality isn't really discussed much and not many people know about it. Even myself, I came across it around 2-3 weeks ago, like, like researching into it. So my first experience with fetal medicine was actually by accident to be honest. So it was my first trip to King's College Hospital for my volunteering. and. We didn't really know where the, where the hospital was, so we were going along and we came across this massive building. Uh, it looked very modern and I saw, a, I saw a paramedic. He had a green box and he was wheeling it in. And from watching a lot of documentaries, I knew what the green box meant. Now the green box essentially is something that contains organic material. It could contain an organ that's been transported or anything on the, on the lines of that. And that really set a sense of intrigue in me which didn't really develop into much for quite a few months, but eventually I came back to it. So I ended up visiting this fetal center and I met a few researchers there. And this is what my presentation is going to be based on today. So, does that, before I proceed forwards, does anyone actually know what fetal medicine is? Any ideas maybe? Matthew? I'm not sure, does it involve like the baby in the womb? Uh, exactly, precisely. Fetus, or fetal medicine, relating to an unborn child in his mother's womb. That's basically, I guess, half the definition done. So the second half of it is, fetal medicine essentially is a speciality that deals with um, women who are, who are expecting a child and their pregnancy would be either high risk or would be quite complicated. Now, you might be thinking, right, okay, I swear that's what the gynecologist or the obstetrician deals with. But wait, there's more to come. So, what are the different types of procedures that fetal medicine deals with? Okay, so fetal medicine deals with several different types, and we're going to focus on one, but I'll just go through them quite quickly. The first one is early diagnosis of fetal abnormalities, which of course we see in a lot of, like, a lot of, we get ultrasounds done, and, and at the center at King's, that was one of the things that they would do. The second thing is chromosomal defect, so you've got genetic testing, you've got Down syndrome, etc. Which, um, it's, there's a lot of debate around the ethics regarding to genetic testing, but that's, that's a discussion for another presentation. And there's also a lot of research going around at uh, those centers, such as development of safer techniques for prenatal diagnosis. But the one that I really want to focus on today is in intra-uterine fetal surgery, because I find surgery cool. Now before going on to that, I want to just briefly mention something. So another thing that they do is something called the prediction and prevention of preeclampsia. So preeclampsia essentially is a condition where the mother uh, who is expecting will have either high blood pressure before or after um, labor occurs. And then of course there's um, growth restriction as well that the fetal clinic can deal with. So now we'll have some cool animations. <coughs> just to make it seem like it's a good presentation. Okay, anyways, now we come to something that I wanted to talk about. We've got intrauterine fetal surgery. Now, what is intrauterine fetal surgery? And what's so special about it that I became so interested? Now, the thing with fetal surgery is, it's a bit different with other surgeries. If you say, let's say cardiac surgery, right? Someone is coming in for an open heart surgery or open heart transplant. There's only one patient on the operating uh, table. And if things go wrong, there's only one tragedy that would occur. However, with fetal surgery, the risks are higher. Because now, with one operation, you can lose two lives. And that's a massive thing. Because now, not only do you have to consider the ethics of one person, of one person you have to balance, is this surgery effective or not? But now you have to balance two people. And mostly what the problem we face is that the mother usually is healthy. She's, uh, she's having uh, everything normal. However, the fetus might not be normal. So now, would you be willing to place a mother who is healthy at risk for a child who isn't even born? And I think that's where ethics comes along. Now, I've just listed quite a few of, the, um, of fetal surgeries and I doubt it would be any benefit of me reading all, the, all of them out because half of them I don't understand either. And I'm guessing the other half you probably won't understand as well. So it's a bit of a waste if I read all of them. The PowerPoint will be available. However, there's two types of surgeries that really interest me. 
The first type is spina bifida, which I'll go into much more. And had I had more time, I would have gone into twin reversed arterial perfusion sequence, which is also something I really find quite interesting. But because of the lack of time and because it's boiling hot, I'll just go with one of them, right? So, before I progress further, I just want to make everyone realize that with medicine, it's it's not a sudden, it's not a sudden, I guess, sudden science. We're building on things that people have done much before us, right? One one discovery will lead on to the next, and that's why I want to bring you upon to uh, to a famous surgeon. Now he's a fetal surgeon, and he was actually inspired by someone known as Christian Barnard. Does anyone know who Christian Barnard is? Okay, so that's a bit that's a bit scary, actually. That fact that no one in the society knows who Christian Barnard it is. Sounds very familiar. Well, it should be because Christian Barnard is the first person to attempt successfully a heart transplant, a human heart transplant. And it's a bit worrying that we don't know that, but anyways. So, the one unknown fact about Christian Barnard is that he wasn't only a heart surgeon, right? He also delved into different things, and one of these was fetal surgery. Him and his team, actually, at many points were successful with some of the procedures they did, but he didn't really go into much of it. However, in his biography, the surgeon here, as a small child, he actually read about this and he was deeply inspired. Similar to me with the fact that you can operate and save a life that hasn't even started. Which is incredible because we try to save lives that might, might die. But here, there's no one living and no one dying. Yet you can save someone to let them live. Which is something very different. Now, why I'm talking about him as well is because he did a very innovative procedure, right? So, okay, if I've got a child, okay? If I've got a child inside of the, inside of the mother and there's, there's a large mass growing on outside, what do you think that might be? Anyone? A large mass. Yeah, a large mass. Can you link this with anything else you've seen before? Okay, why would you say that? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. That makes sense. So, okay, both are both are genuine ideas. Actually, both of you are correct to some extent, right? So, Marion is correct. This surgeon here actually I was faced with a tumor. So, the child was in the mother's uterus, and the child developed a massive tumor. The tumor was slowly killing the girl to death, right? And the mother, she re as of course a lot of mothers would have, they've got a lot of connection with their child, right? Emotional connection and attachment. So she said, do whatever you can to save my, my child, right? Who's unborn. And so he became involved. What he designed, his uh, surgery, was that he, they would make us, okay, let me take a pen break. So, hold on. Or right here. So if we say, for a better pen, that might help. So if we say that's the mother, right? So if the child is in there, right? Now, usually there's nothing you can do. The child is essentially, you would go for an abortion, right? But what he developed was, he would make a small incision uh, and he would access the uterus. Now, once he accesses the uterus, what's, what's quite cool is because now you've suddenly exposed the amniotic sac, which is below here. This is the amniotic sac, and this contains the child. So what they did was, first, they operated on the mother, then they reached the amniotic sac, which we all know what it is, right? Yeah, that's good. So then they repositioned the child and saw where the massive mass of tumor cells were. Okay, let's say that's the tumor. Okay. And then they started to operate, and they were able to remove that tumor. And after that, they closed, um, they essentially closed um, the amniotic sac. Now, actually, I'd like to pose you a question because I had this question as well and I went to Quora to answer it, which thankfully it did. But why do we bother making a massive incision there? Why don't we just access it through intra or train or through the birth canal? What is the reason that we must make an incision? Because, hang on, making incisions means more recovery time, which is a massive problem, more risk of in infection. What is the reason? Any ideas? Because you can't access it. You can access you can access the um, the amniotic sac through the uh, birth canal. There's no problem with that. Is it the actual removal of the tumor? Like, can you physically get the tumor out through its 
Well, that is that is a small factor, but there's a massive there's another massive factor. The thing is, this amniotic sac is quite interesting. The amniotic sac, when it's it's open from here, it's able to heal. Okay. However, if it's open intra uterine, you're not the amniotic sac isn't able to heal, and that's a massive problem, right? Because if it's healed here, that's fine. It's a normal delivery after that. However, if it's not properly healed, then that can lead to massive problems both for the mother and the child. And another thing that can be considered is that the idea of infections, because you one sec, we might say that this procedure might seem to lead to more infections. However, going through the birth canal means that you're going through a lot of microorganisms that are present in the birth canal, which can lead to even more uh, infections to the actual child. Abdullah, you had a question? Um, yes, yeah, so how come there's healing um, from making an incision then compared to, um, you know, um, and inserting intra Sorry, can you repeat that please? How come there is healing yeah. when you make an incision but not when you um, enter into the um, intravenous? Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, essentially, the way I actually figured this out wasn't by myself. It was me basically pestering a professor, a random professor in the US. So, he explained that, yeah, yeah, I know I'm, I'm not the most polite at times, but, anyways. So, what he explained was that. The actual location of the amniotic sac, right? Because we know it can, we can turn it around, etc. The actual location is what makes it beneficial. And he said there's a far more complicated things going on that you prob your intellect probably can't hold. So I didn't really go further after that. But I think that, that should hopefully maybe sort of answer it. I hope so. Maybe you should give him a him more pestering. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Fair enough. Now let's proceed forwards before I end up running out of time, which I seriously do think I will. But anyways, so we come to the things that I wanted, well, the condition that I wanted to talk about. The condition I want to talk about is spinal fitter. Now, looking for in the pictures, can we make any sense of what's going on? Because it's very, look, any condition that's been found, right? It wasn't suddenly born, right? It's been there, someone's gone, someone's had a look at it, right? And someone's figured it out someone's figured out what's going wrong and that's a very important skill as doctors we need good problem solving skills because maybe there's another disease that we haven't come across maybe there's a condition or a situation that we haven't prepared for and hence it's paramount for us to be able to develop our problem solving so can anyone give it give a go at what do they think might be going wrong here Abby? Okay, that, that, that's a very good attempt at it. Anyone else? So, I would, I, I would build on that. So, okay, accumulation of fluid in there, fine. What else? What, what, look, we all have like, for example, boils on our skin, right? That's an accumulation of fluid, but it doesn't mean someone's gonna die. What's the problem? Anyone? Let's pick on people. Uh, Tanya. And have a go. What do you think is going on here? Look, does it look normal? First of all. Exactly. And I'm not sure if it's visible from back there, but okay, just Karen. What do you think is the problem here? Yeah, and what's what's coming out? And is that closed or what what is that? Have a look here. Does this look normal? Yeah, it's, it's been enlarged outwards, right? It's pushing outwards. And when it's pushing outwards, you can see this is a weak point, okay? So now let me actually explain what it is. Now, I think we all have come quite close to the actual condition, but there's a bit more to it. So, yeah, impact and what it is, don't mind that. Okay. So essentially, this, this actual condition is when the baby's spine and spinal cord don't actually develop properly in the uterus of the mother. And um, the sentence cut short, but anyways. That's essentially it. So the spine hasn't formed properly, spine and spinal cord haven't formed properly whilst the child was inside of the mother's uterus. And now it's been pushed outwards in a sac filled with fluid. You see, as I said, we were going to come back to the fluid point. You're right about that. Now, there's three different types of spinal bifida, right? If you have two of those, it doesn't make a massive impact to your life. However, if you have I'm going to go and give a try at pronouncing this. 
here it goes. If you have myo de meningocele, I don't know, something like that, that's a problem. Because what happens with this is everything's being forced outwards. And when it's being forced outwards, you have many conditions that can occur after that. And let's say I'll come back to that. Yeah. So the conditions that might occur are things like paralysis, okay? Paralysis, a lack of bowel uh, movement control, incontinence. And these aren't problems that every child, any child should have to deal with because these are massive inconveniences in everyday life. If we look at the biopsychosocial model, yes, there's a problem with the biology of it, but this biological problem will permeate into the social problems as well. Because a child, think about it, the child can't easily go camping, they can't go on trips, they can't play sports easily, right? It's a massive impact on the child's life. Now, okay, so I've said this is a congenital condition. Everyone knows what congenital is? It's something, it's something that you had when you were born, essentially, right? Okay. But if we've got a heart congenital defect, we don't really mind. We let the child be born and then we'll operate and then pick them up, right? We've got holes in the heart, etc. What's different here? What's the problem? Okay, but hang on. We know that the ch we know that there's a lot of children who are born with paralysis. So what's going on here? Would it be that? Um condition just keeps getting worse and worse as the child stays longer in the womb. Precisely. This condition starts off at very minor, okay? But as the child is in the womb, it starts to grow and increase. Increasing to the point that you've got massive problems occurring when the child is born. You've got paralysis, bowel, um, bowel, bowel movements that they can't control, incontinence, etc. It's a massive problem. That's not something we face in heart defects because we can let the child be born and we can operate on them all good right it doesn't work here so yep you've done that now it's not exactly current because it's not current anymore but previous treatments better better to say in previous treatments what we had was we would let the child be born with paralysis then we would just close the thing up do you think that was much to avail of a child who wants to play sports going camping and just do everything that a child does do you think that child quality of life improved with that procedure anyone Right, why would you say so? Because that doesn't seem the worst. So say the surgeon was given quite early on to put them because she had an experience in it. Well, the child is born. We need to remember this. Oh, without the surgery? Though. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the quality of life hasn't been improved massively, right? It's just, okay, yeah, we've done the surgery, we've closed everything up. But that child is still going to suffer throughout their life. Welcome to the world of fetal surgery and how can we not do a massive picture of a surgeon in my presentations? So let's get scrubbed up and let's actually explore how this surgery occurs. And I'm going to have to do this quite quickly. So I've got eight minutes left, but I think we can do it. All right. So we're scrubbed up, but we've done all of the cleaning up, etc. We're not going to go into that because if you're operating on someone, I hope you do know that. Anyways, so who's actually involved in this? Now, this requires a lot of people. We need four fetal surgeons, approximately. We need one neurosurgeon. We need two anesthetists, so I'm sure you can come along, right? Um, you need a fetal medicine specialist, specialist, right? And you need specialized nurses. And finally, you need um, an obstetrician or a gynecologist, right? This is part of the multidisciplinary and I haven't even include, included people who aren't even scrubbed in. So that's a lot of people in the operating theatre. So let's start with the actual surgery. Okay, so the fetal surgeons will make an incision uh, on the abdomen to access the uterus. Now, yeah, they can't see this, right? Like just to clarify someone thinking that maybe let's give it a go. It, it, it's not that simple, it doesn't look like this. Just to clarify. Okay, so now the surgeon with beautiful x-ray vision can see exactly what's going on. So here we've got the spinal bifida, right? This is the problem. So we made an incision, right? And actually, the thing what I was a bit confused about was, hang on, if I put a scalpel in, how do I know how far that's going, right? That could just kill the child. And um, it's not usually helpful. Take two more minutes. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, it can kill the child, etc. Fine. Uh, okay, the neurosurgeon and fetal surgeon will essentially um, uh, remove the remove the actual problem. Yeah, we'll remove the problem and then they'll close everything up. Uh, skin is closed over the muscle layers, watertight. Um, and the mother's uterus is then closed closed up uh, using stitches or a special uh, technique known as lacing. Uh, and then a delivery occurs at 37 weeks, which is not exactly ideal, but it's better than having a child with paralysis. Um, whilst it's not a cure, this, this surgery allows a lot of children's um, life quality to be increased. And the unfortunate truth is with this condition, a lot of people just live to the age of 40, which isn't a lot for us if we think about it. Now, this is a girl who would have been paralyzed, and this is her now, after having fetal surgery. That's what I want to express. Fetal surgery is one of the most uh, iconic things of the century, to be honest. This is where the fetal medicine center that I visited, and just to quote then. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to my presentation.